So uh, easy day today. I'm not going to present anything new. We're just going to go over the test. Yeah? We're going to do the same thing that we did last time. We'll go through question by question, talk about the answers, and discuss whether anything that should, wasn't considered an answer should be considered an answer. I think, we, I think it'll probably be not as bad as last time uh, for the simple reason that the average on the multiple choice was much, much higher. The average on the multiple choice was 82 this time. So I was very pleased to see. So most of you did quite well on the multiple choice. Lots and lots of 10 out of 10s. So excellent work on this one. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back from the short answer stuff. Uh, I think the TAs are prioritizing getting your argument analyses back to you uh, as soon as possible so you can have feedback to start on the next one. So the next one is due November 30th, I believe. And so I should be posting the arguments for that analysis this week. And hopefully they'll get your analyses back to you this week. So you'll see when that happens, I'll put an announcement on Blackboard. Uh, you'll see your mark on Blackboard and you'll be able to look at their comments on UTOR submit. So they'll re-upload your files with comments on them and a detailed breakdown of your grade. Uh, and you can look at those by logging back into UTOR submit. Okay? So, uh, and I believe test or quiz three is supposed to be due next week as well. Uh, I might push that back a little bit. I might push the due date back a couple of days so that I have a couple more days to write quiz three. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so any course mechanics questions before we go on? No? Yeah? Did you, f I hope you found that test to be reasonable. I hope there were not any big surprises on that test for you. That uh, once you sort of knew what kind of tests I write, you knew what to expect. And I, I think the average will be, even on the short answer stuff, will be fairly high. So uh, yeah. All right, so let's go through these. So a statement is analytic if and only if which this negation is contradictory, it's been proven to be true, it follows from empirical facts, or a set of, if one thing is true, then another must also be true. A. A. That's the only one that is both a necessary and sufficient condition for something to be analytic. Notice I put if and only if this time, having learned my lesson from last time, the difference between a description and a definition. If you say if and only if you're asking for something to be both necessary and sufficient, right? So, uh, you know, an analytic statement could be B, it could be proven to be true, but being proven to be true is not, you know, an, something's not analytic if and only if it's proven to be true, right? Because you can prove empirical statements. Yeah? Does that seem reasonable to everyone? Okay, great. This might be a short class. If you're, if you're not gonna argue with me, this might be a short class, that's fine. <clears throat> Uh, in the sense of acceptability described in this course, the following things can be acceptable. I think I stomped my feet enough about this that most of you got this one. It, it, it annoyed me when people said, for example, that uh, an argument is acceptable. Because that's not what acceptability means, right? Well, not in this class. It's perfectly normal and fine to say that an argument is acceptable in anything, any context other than this class. But I kind of demanded that you use this word in only one way, which was which. Premises. Premises are the only thing that can be acceptable. So you, you determine in your argument analysis, is this premise acceptable or not? Inferences are not acceptable. What are they? They're like valid or invalid, right? Yeah, so uh, premises are the, things, are the only things that can be acceptable. Not arguments, not inferences, and certainly not arguments, inferences, and premises. Yeah? So far, so good. Whew, okay. So an inductive system, I'm, I am a little bit nervous when I'm doing this because I, I, it's often the case that people show me things that I didn't realize about these questions, but so, so far we're doing all right. So an inductive syllogism does the following. Starts from an analytic truth and moves to an empirical generalization. Starts from an empirical generalization and moves to an analytic truth. I think those are just irrelevant. C, starts from facts about a population and moves to facts about a sample of population. See, that's the one I was looking for. Yeah, that's an inductive, an inductive syllogism. D is closer, but that's the inductive generalization. Yeah? <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Any questions about that? Any worries? Okay, great. 
False dichotomy, the practice of dichotomizing falsehoods. That's for those of you who have not studied but are trying to work out the answers from just looking at the questions. It's a, it's a good skill to have. I'm just trying to throw you off the trail here. We're trying to, no, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm trying to diagnose whether you've studied the material. Uh, an error in reasoning resulting from considering too few possibilities. Yeah, that's the one. B is the one that I was looking for. Uh, another term for disjunctive syllogism. Nah, disjunctive syllogism is not an error in reasoning. It's not a, it's not a false dichotomy. It's where you have a dichotomy, and it's a good dichotomy. You say, like, it's either raining or it's not. It's not raining, therefore it is raining. That's a disjunctive syllogism, but you haven't made some terrible error there. You just sort of said something true. Uh, or when an argument contains inconsistent premises, I don't think that's anything to do with this. Yeah? Okay, good. Tu quoque translates to you too. This is, I think that's the only one that is even remotely close to the answer. Yeah? Okay. Uh, I feel bad about this style of question because it's not really testing your understanding. Uh, like, it's not testing any deep skill set that you've developed by being in this class. But here we are. It does, it was hopefully at least semi-diagnostic about whether you studied. Okay, so that was it for the open kind of multiple choice questions. Now we'll do these uh, mapping questions, ma matching these arguments to their diagrams. So, all dogs go to heaven, Bosco's a dog, Bosco's going to heaven, therefore Bosco will get to eat all the treats he wants forever. B? B? D. D. And why is it D? What, what did you use to infer that it was D? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. One and two are dependently related because they're remotest ponens, leading to uh, the third premise, which then leads to the conclusion. Yeah? That's exactly why this is, why this, is this one. Uh, and you can't make it any of the other ones because those are dependent premises. Any, any other diagram would represent them as independent. Uh, the Pope said that dogs do go to heaven, by the way. So according to the Catholics, this at least P1, he didn't say all dogs go to heaven. I guess there could be jerk dogs that don't get to go to heaven. But at least some of them do get to go to heaven, according to the Pope. All right. The sun is setting. It will be dark soon. It looks like rain. Therefore, we should go. We should go home. D. Oh, B. B. Yes. Okay. So, I think that was the answer too. So, the sun is setting is a reason to believe that it will be dark soon, right? Those are not unrelated, but neither are they a dependent reason for something else. And it looks like rain. So, and it will be dark soon is itself an independent reason why you might want to go home. Similarly. It looks like rain might be an independent reason why you might want to go home. So P1 leading to P2, leading to the conclusion. P3 also leading independently to the conclusion. Okay. Does anybody want to make a case for another one? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, really, I really tried to set it up that P1 and P2 are importantly related. That they're not, they're not completely independently unrelated to each other. Yeah? So, I think B is better. Yeah? Noticing something else here, though. Like, aren't P2 and P3 potentially related as well? Yeah. 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 Although that wouldn't, uh, just because of the way the premises are labeled. I don't think any of the other diagrams fit other than possibly A. Possibly A. Yeah. Because the sun is setting, but sometimes it rains and it's not dark yet. 
That's true. That's true. That's my favorite kind of weather. Sun showers are my absolute favorite kind of weather. Yeah. Right, there's one up here. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. also not just because the sun is setting uh, doesn't always mean that it will stay in dark. Uh, where we live, that's okay. true. But, um, <laughs> Right, so, I mean, Making a possible, uh, yeah, 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 okay. Um, in that sense, I would say that the sun is not setting. Uh, although, if you put it, you know, you could put this slightly differently. So if you're, I, I visited Iceland once, and it wasn't the 24 hours sun, but the sun just sort of like dipped under the horizon, so the sky was still light. The sun had set in the sense of going below the horizon, but the sky was still light. So. This isn't really an argument for another one of these diagrams. It's more just that it's not that great an argument. But yeah, yeah, so yeah. Maybe. I think they mean that it's going to be dark, like that it's not light out. So if somebody if somebody is in the North Pole or like near the Arctic Circle and the sun is about to go below the horizon but it's not going to be dark out, I think they would say it's going to be night soon, but not that it's going to be dark soon. I don't know how Icelandic people talk about this stuff, though. <laughs> so, OK. OK, but let's, the really important question is, is A an acceptable answer to this question? Um, I think we've actually put enough air between the sun is setting and it will be dark soon to make A an acceptable answer here. Because if the fact that the sun is setting isn't necessarily related to it being dark, and if it, near the Arctic Circle it is not necessarily rela related, maybe you know, the sun is setting and it will be dark soon because it's going to get cloudy, and that's why it also is going to look like rain. I don't know. Does that not, does that not sound like a reasonable inference to you? I don't know. That's probably not what you had in mind. <laughs> the way I look at it is that you can still say, no matter what, it will be dark soon. Oh. Because the sun will be setting, so it will be dark soon. Good, good. So the relevance of P1, P2, and P3 don't depend. So the fact that, uh, so if for whatever reason it's going to be dark soon, that might be a reason to get home. If it's because the sun is setting, that might be a reason to get home, even if it's not going to get dark. And it looking like rain could be a reason, even if it's not nighttime. Excellent. Write that down. OK, so I got to <laughs> go back through all of these and uh, give credit on this one for diagram A. Which question was this? Uh, this is five, six, seven. Excellent. That's the second time you've been the first person to convince me of a, a new answer. <laughs> good work. OK. Good. So this is, I, I fear I'm, I'm inculcating you with, with habits that are bad for your life, because you're like, most people aren't this persnickety about stuff. They're, they're not willing to like, be this fine grain. But nonetheless, this is, this is helpful, I think. OK, let's do the next one. So we have a blanket. We have food. It's a nice day. We should have a picnic. A. A is what I was aiming at. Those are all independent reasons why it might be a good idea to have a picnic. Yeah? And none of them are necessary, but each of them is relevant independently. Yeah? Good, good. OK, this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Bam, bam. Uh, I, uh, I don't think having a blanket or having food are reasons to believe that it's a nice day in the sense of the weather being nice. I, so I took it that nice day referred not just to the day that you're having, but like the, the, the general day of it all. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So that's part of a, partly premise three is an idiom. So it's not just, it's not just a literal description. Like this is a day I'm having and it's nice. It's more like 
it's a nice day out is implied, I think. Yeah? Okay. This one. Mangoes are juicy. Mangoes are sweet. Mangoes are good to eat. I'll have a mango for a snack. Okay, so uh, somebody who said A, what's the what's the reasoning? I hang on, I haven't heard from you. Yeah. So mangoes are juicy for independent reasons. Mangoes right. are sweet, and then I put uh, good means healthy. Right. So same fact of healthy doesn't come into good fact of juicy sweet. Good, good. So yeah. Plus. <laughs> Uh, so if good means enjoyable or delicious or something like that, that's, so that's exactly what I had in mind when I was writing this question. Uh, while you were writing the test, Michael, uh, my friend and the TA for this course, do you mean healthy or do you mean good? Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't mean it's unhealthy. Right. That's true. That's true. Oh, it doesn't mean it is healthy. Wait, so what do you, what's the conclusion we should, what should, would you, oh, right, so, uh, yeah, yeah, so she's arguing for A, she's arguing, arguing for A, yeah, so that would be three totally separate reasons why you might want to have a mango for a snack, because they're juicy and they're, uh, they're sweet and they're healthy for you, yeah. Uh, the alternative, of course, is that juicy and sweet are reasons to think that it's good in the sense of good, good, fun stuff to put in your mouth, and then it would be diagram C, yeah? Okay, so having been identified, a number of people, like a couple of people from the class asked me, like, do you mean healthy here? And uh, the TA was like, do you mean healthy here? So be before I even talk to you about this, I marked both A and C as correct answers to this, if that's, I hope that's fair. I, I should have made you argue for it so you'd have more of a sense of accomplishment, but that's still, that's, uh, I think it was, yeah, there's too much, too much indication that, uh, that this was ambiguous deeply. Yeah? Uh, if we don't know what a mango is, and someone says, hey, it's juicy, it's sweet, it's good to eat. Yeah. But it's kind of like spiky, that hurts you. <laughs> okay. So is P3 valid in terms of uh, P1 and P2, therefore it's P3? Uh, oh, so is the, careful now, don't, don't say a premise is valid. The inference, so is the inference from P1 and P2 to P3 valid? Certainly not deductively valid, which is what you're pointing out, I think. So there are cases where something is juicy and sweet, and nonetheless, you're not going to want to eat it for either health or deliciousness reasons. Yeah? So certainly it's the case that it's not deductively valid. Um, I think it's generally true that if something is juicy and sweet, it's probably good to eat, or at least it's a, it, should, it should at least raise the probability in your mind that this is going to be a good thing to eat. You know, it's full of sugar, it's full of water. Those are, those are positive properties for foodstuffs to have, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Well-made buildings do not fall down. This building fell down. This was not a well-made building. Therefore, the builders should be sued. D. I would say D. And why D, again? It's a modus tollens, in fact. It's a modus tollens. So somebody asked me if this is a fallacy. It looks a lot like a fallacy, right? This is one of those ones where it's probably like it's sort of similar to a fallacy, but it isn't. This is a valid argument form. So if you say uh, if P then Q and not Q, you can validly infer not P. And that's, that's what we've done in this argument structure, yeah? Uh, these are dependent reasons for the conclusion, not Q, or not P. So if it's raining, then the sidewalks are wet. The sidewalks are not wet. You can validly infer that it was not raining. Assuming this is true and this is true, you get to this thing. Yeah? OK. So and it's, although it's not modus ponens, it's modus tollens. It's nonetheless uh, dependent reasons for believing P3. And then P3 is a reason to believe the conclusion independently. Yeah. Uh, missing premises all over the place here, you know, the should, should twig you that, like, look, look, we need another premise to get to the conclusion, but that wasn't the exercise here, so, yeah? Good. Was that it? Yeah, I think that was it. Okay. 
OK, let's do these. So uh, the too broad, too narrow. So uh, is this too broad or too narrow, and why? A university is a place where people go to learn practical skills. Taking a philosophy course, something should occur to you. Right, right. Just go one way or the other. A definition? Yeah, too broad of a definition. I'm trying to remember the specific thing that I wrote. Oh. But uh, it's broad because it, oh my gosh, I know all the time. Right, so if, any, if you call any place where you learn practical skills a university, you'll misidentify the category of universities, right? You can learn practical skills all over the place. Yeah? You can also learn impractical skills in the university? Like philosophy. You can learn philosophy here, and that will do you no good in your practical life. It'll make you a whole human, but that is actually an extremely, extremely impractical goal. Uh, anybody else have different reasons for too broad or too narrow? Want to throw it? I think it's both too broad and too, too narrow, and those were, those were good reasons. Either one of those should, should have gotten you full marks. So you know, there are places that you learn practical skills that aren't universities, and there's lots of other things that you do at a university other than learn practical skills. Yeah? OK. Uh, a computer is a device used to calculate sums. Yeah? Too narrow, because. Yeah, you, yeah. Totally, there's, there's a zillion things you can do with a computer that aren't calculating sums. Yeah? Too broad because you could use a calculator? Exactly. Very good. Yeah, you could use a calculator, you can use an abacus, you can use a pen and pencil. Uh, very good. Some other? Yeah? Yeah. Um, Historically, we haven't. Like, uh, historically, people have accepted that there are calculators that aren't computers, typically. Certainly, there are, all, there are devices you can use to calculate sums that aren't computers, like an abacus is certainly not a computer in any of the usual ways of using that word. Yeah? Uh, the, that's a good question, but the, yeah, it gets us to the ambiguity of all definitions. We're like, what is a computer really? And the answer is, eh, I don't know. Whatever, whatever people, however people use that word, it doesn't matter. I, I hope you didn't write that on your test. It's, it's too apathetic sounding, but that's, I think that's the actual answer. Yeah? Satisfied with that? Good. Okay, on to the fallacies. So to what degree is the following a legitimate appeal to authority and why? Some philosophers argue that time is an illusion and they are specialists, so they should know. A philosopher is definitely the only person who would stand in front of a crowd and tell them that time is an illusion. I think that's I think that's uh, something that we can be confident in. Yeah. People typically don't bother to write that down because it's so obvious, but yeah, it's lots of philosophers think time is not an illusion, but I think this is, yeah, th your, your point that uh, philosophers might have the relevant kind of specialty should be acceptable as an answer, and also the lack of consensus should be acceptable as an answer. Both of those cite uh, the features that you want and appeal to authority to have, so good. Linguists? I'm stunned that you had that conversation in it. Was it a linguistics or a psychology class? Sorry, psychology. psychology, psychologists. I'm stunned that that's that they had that debate. I think that they're they're trampling on our territory right now. That's that's, that's philosopher stuff. The psychologists should stick to their lab work. 
<laughs> no, I'm, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm amazed that that, that they've done that they did that actually. Right, right. Okay, so like stuff like the Saper Whorf hypothesis that says like your your temporal grammar affects the way you experience time or something like that. That's very that's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, if you wrote that on your test, I hope you got a point for it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so that would be, if that's right, it might show us, it might be evidence at least, that uh, other disciplines are also interested in this question. Uh, I don't think that that excludes philosophers from having a legitimate claim to be uh, sort of focused on that question. Yeah? Philosophers have been kicking this one around since like before Plato. This is like Zeno's paradox of motion and uh, Parmenides, like the people who inspired Socrates and Plato were arguing that time is just an illusion. Uh, so we've been on this one for several thousand years now. I'm, I'll have a talk with a psychologist to tell them to get off our territory. That's, uh, yeah. Okay, any other questions on this? Yeah, hi. Uh, to make an argument for psychologists. Yeah, okay. <laughs> psychology actually originates from philosophy. It actually originates from like study of soul. And right. Very good. Okay, so you're, this is this is an argument for uh, actually psychologists have taken up this question that started in philosophy and are making it rigorous and scientific. All right, fair enough. That's fair enough. We do. I mean, yes. Uh, so, but that's that's a so that that various sciences originated in philosophy is is I think true, but like. That doesn't mean that philosophy gets to say, oh, no, actually, the studying of ma matter and motion is actually a philosophical thing because we started it. Uh, we, we don't get to sort of like claim that that's just our question anymore because there are serious, rigorous approaches to these questions that have been brought to bear. And, you know, we don't do experiments or anything. So, so yeah. So, yes, psych psychologists uh, have a legitimate claim to, to seriously study, especially stuff like cognition of time, like how do you experience time and all that. Those are... Those are very definitely central to psychology. So, so I jest. I jest. All right. <clears throat> that got deeper than I expected. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad it did. Uh, so, to what degree is the following an ad hominem fallacy, and why? My father says smoking is really bad, but he smokes all day long. Yeah. Good. So, that's an ad hominem fallacy. Yeah. Do you have you know, more? Um, I just wrote that I'm not, uh, he doesn't really say that. He's not, he's not, he's not trying to say that, no, look, your argument is wrong. Right. So you're, because you smoke food. Yeah. But he's just saying that, he's just stating a fact that my father said that smoking is really bad, but he smokes too. So I said that if he had said that, okay. if his father had said that, look, you shouldn't smoke, and then he argued that my father's, Father says smoking is really bad, but he does it too, then it would be a two-quote. Two-quote way. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay, good. So I hadn't thought of that. I thought this was a really clear ad hominem fallacy, but I guess it really depends. So what, I, th I take it what you're saying is that it depends on the stakes of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, if the real conclusion is my father's an asshole, <laughs> then this might be good evidence, right? Like. Right, because the hypocrisy makes you lose your moral authority. Like you don't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hold people up as moral models if they're hypocrites. And this is evidence that he's a hypocrite. Uh, so if that's the real conclusion, like my father's a jerk, uh, this could be a perfectly good argument for that. Um, I took it that the conclusion was something like. So I assumed the conclusion was, therefore, my father's not a reliable source on this. So on this particular topic of, so the, you know. Uh, my father says smoking is really bad, and the conclusion was supposed to be that uh, he's wrong about that because he smokes all day long. So if you did, th if that was the way you read this, I think you should get full marks. If you read it as like, hey, maybe we we don't actually know what the what the con conversational context is, I think that's great that you added another layer to this. So yeah, yeah, like uh, ad hominem is tricky because. There really are stakes when you're a hypocrite. Like, it doesn't, it's not irrelevant that you're doing one thing and saying another in some comprehensive way. It's just irrelevant to whether you're correct about a <coughs> given conclusion. Yeah? But the father's nice to him every morning, and that's why he's asking the child not to smoke. Because sure, yeah. He has a first time authority, and like, this is why he thinks it's bad. You can see. Right. Smoking, but it's bad. It's not a religion of yours. 
<laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah, okay. That's a more, more sympathetic. Thank you. That's a more, it's a more kind and sympathetic interpretation of this. So yeah, the, the, it could actually be that the father, this is a good appeal to authority. Say, look, I know smoking is bad because I've been addicted for years and years. I know what it does to you. I know how hard it is. I know how hard it is to quit. So you shouldn't do it. Trust me, I know. That could be a good legitimate appeal to authority. Say, you know, like I have a lot of firsthand experience with how this affects people. So you should believe me. So good, yeah, that's much, that's much nicer, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Try not to be so cynical here, yeah. Okay, yeah? I think it's to cite yourself as an authority in an argument, uh, like, yeah, I don't know. So it's not circular to cite your own expertise, right? So, so it says, somebody says to me, what do you know about philosophy, Corey? He's like, well, I, I did a PhD in it. I mean, that's bringing a new bit of evidence. To the, I think that, I take it that that's bringing a new bit of evidence. That's good. It's a rude thing to do in conversation, but nonetheless, it's not circular as such, uh, because if they didn't already know that I have a background in this, that might be new information that's relevant to the conclusions. Like, yeah, no, I actually, you know, I spent my whole adult life studying philosophy, so that's why I think I know something about it, sort of, sort of thing. Uh, so that's not circular as such, but if they already knew that I did this, and they're like, why should I believe you? And, and I say, well, because I have a PhD, it's just really weak argument, right? It's just like, that's not a reason to believe me. That's a reason to like listen in the first place or something like that. Yeah? Yeah. Good. Okay. To what degree is the following a case of the appeal to authority, appeal to ignorance fallacy, and why? If there are a way to travel faster than light, we would have worked it out by now. I don't love this question. This is an okay, I don't, I don't know if this is a great question, but uh, what, what, did you, what did you say? Well, okay, so the, you, I was with you right up, so you're saying like, look, there's tons of stuff we don't know about the universe. That strikes me as exactly right. There are some reasons to think that we can't travel faster than light, like special relativity and general relativity are some of the best confirmed scientific theories in history, right? They're like really, really predictively successful, and they both have kind of built right in this speed limit, right? So uh, insofar as you think those are the correct answer to how physics works, then you do have a reason to believe that we can't travel faster than light. Uh, do you have a reason to believe that those are the complete stories about how physics works? Definitely not, right? Yeah. Well, like here it says we would have worked it out by now. Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Right. Right. Good. So I think that I think that's that's right. And that fits with the first the first half of what you're saying there, which is just like look. There's so much we don't know about the universe. There's tons we don't know about the universe. We have just started learning about the basic structure of physics in the last couple hundred years, like a blink of the eye in sort of long-term thinking. So I would agree that, so if you wrote on your test that this is an uh, appeal to authority fallacy, I think that, and gave these kind of reasons, I think that's right. right? Like, look, there's no reason to think that we would have, there's no reason to think that we're finished physics and therefore no reason to think that if there was a way we would have worked at it. Yeah? Anybody, yeah, yeah? Very good. So you, yeah, you, you, you trap light in like a crystal or something like that and just walk by. Uh, that's very good. Okay, good. This is true. No, this is true. You can slow down, you can slow down light in certain media. Uh, light in a vacuum, of course, has a constant velocity, but yeah, you can, you can do that. Very good. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
So this is just incorrect entirely. It's not even a fallacy. They're just straight wrong about it. Yeah. Good. Anything else on this? It's great. OK. Uh, right. And then there was this thing, this, this argument. Uh, I hope this was reasonably straightforward. Compared to the arguments you're doing in your argument analyses, this should have struck you as, as child's play, more or less. Yeah? Like, I think there's four premises in a conclusion. So what's the conclusion? It's the first sentence, right? Should be no, there should be no minimum wage. So conclusion, no minimum wage. Uh, premise one. I think that's equivalent to there should be no minimum wage. What's, oh, uh, tell me the difference between uh, there should be no minimum wage and the minimum wage should be abolished. Because right now we have the minimum wage. In Caribbean, the tax is abolished because the minimum wage doesn't exist. And the fact that there should be no minimum wage follows from the fact that if there is minimum wage, it should abolish. Uh, I just still don't see the difference. So to say there should be no minimum wage doesn't say that there isn't one now, right? But there is one right now, we know that. Yes, but there's no contradiction between saying there should be none and there is one. One is a normative claim and one is a descriptive claim. Yeah? Yeah? In that case, they, that could be the conclusion too. That's right. So I think there are two instances of the conclusion here. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, uh, yeah, this, as, as I read this argument, uh, it's really just got the same conclusion twice. It should be, there should be no minimum wage, minimum wage should be abolished. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. And then there's really just two lines of argument leading to that. Uh, so, uh, it's immoral. To restrict freedom, something like that. P1. Uh, it's wrong because it violates people's rights to autonomy. Uh, if you wanted to compress those two into one premise, I think that should be okay, actually. So, uh, uh, actually, yeah, so it's immoral to restrict freedom. It's wrong because it violates people's right to autonomy. So P1, because it violates autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, yeah, so minimum wage for small businesses. And then I think there was a premise given as a reason for this premise. Uh, Is, is that, I mean, that would be a reason to believe this, but uh, I think that's not given in this argument. It's that they have, it's the flexibility thing, yeah? Biz, big businesses have more flexibility than their, with their employees, yeah? Yeah, I think that's a better reason to believe this than the one given, but nonetheless, that was the one given. So, uh, big business has more flexibility. And I think the structure is just like this. Uh, P1 leading to the conclusion, P2 leading to P1, uh, P3 leading to the conclusion, and P4 leading to P3. Yeah? Something like that. Once again, uh, we've asked, I've asked the TAs to be broad-minded, and if you didn't break it down exactly this way, or you didn't draw exactly this diagram, but you did do something that made some sense, Hopefully, they'll give you full credit. Uh, 
once again, you'll have to wait. Well, you'll have to wait until you actually see your paper and how it was marked. But I'll invite you, if you want exp explanation or clarification or just to argue with me, I'll invite you to come to my office hours and or email me about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that was it, more or less, for argument assessment. We've done the first two thirds of the course. The final third is going to start on Thursday. And it's a bit experimental, so I hope it goes well. Uh, we're really going to start talking about how, how this stuff plays out in a human mind. Like, we're going to talk about, on Thursday, cognitive biases. And then all next week, we're going to talk about cognition and mental health, where like, the most important argument that you'll ever have is with yourself, like your own internal monologue, is the argument that you have the best chance of actually winning since you're both sides of it. Uh, and also because you have a deep trust of the person you're arguing with, hopefully. Uh, so really, we're just going to try to take some of these tools and skills and see how they transfer to thinking about yourself, thinking about dealing with your own internal monologue. So that's more or less the plan. And then one course on one class on paradoxes, just because I think it's fun. OK, great. Thanks, everyone.